We got a red light there. Good. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. recording. It's so, blinking. Uh, um, as far as where you're gonna look, um, you can just look straight ahead. Just kind of concentrate on that camera there. Even if I ask you something, just try okay. to look at that. Okay. Don't mind me. All right, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Uh, I guess I've been told here that uh, I should introduce myself uh, prior to uh, doing anything else. My name is Ben Hinton, and I was Worshipful Master of this Lodge in the year 2000, which has been around 16, 17 years ago uh, at the time of this recording. Uh, we are actually sitting in the lodge room and the senior warden's chair at uh, the lodge right now. Got a couple of nice young men here, young masons that uh, want to start uh, do a little bit of filming here in order to let uh, folks know what we're really all about. And uh, actually this is a good place to be. So what I will do is uh, probably take a few questions from them and we'll take it from there. Tell me about Freemasonry. Well, the first thing I need to do is to tell you about Freemasonry. Uh, its origin, I cannot uh, quite go that far back. It's been here a long time, of course. Uh, I've been in this particular lodge here for around 40 years. I've been associated with it since uh, 1952. Uh, that's when my brother-in-law went into lodge and I used to go with him there. Uh, currently, we have every chair in this lodge filled by an installed officer, which I think is great. We have a lot of youth in this lodge that I am extremely proud of. And we'll stop right there and uh, you can edit that. So far, so good. Doing great. Okay. What is a past master and are you one? Ask again, please. What is a past master and are you one? Oh yes, I am a past master. A past master is uh, someone that has completed the seven chairs in this lodge. There is seven chairs in here that must be filled uh, by uh, installation and a proclamation made in order for him to uh, go through the line. Uh, you really need to be pretty dedicated to do that, which is actually not too hard to do. Uh, you meet a lot of good people here that's willing to help you along the way. And uh, we seem to have a very good time. We have quite a few outside activities that we do, like uh, on the 4th of July we have our corn roast, uh, we have our annual fish fry, and as long as we're able to do those, uh, we seem to keep our dues rate down some. So we all seem to be working together at a very great pace here. Stop. Ready for the lodge, uh, the St. John question? Uh, Do you want I, to answer that? I can give you a short version of that. Okay, hold on one second. Why is the lodge dedicated to St. John? Well, actually the lodge has took on many different uh, phases over the years. Back, to, uh, I'm told in the beginning, uh, it was dedicated to Moses. It was also dedicated to Noah and St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. These were chosen people by God. And I thought to myself that that's pretty appropriate to dedicate the lodge to the Holy St. John. All right. Yeah, you can just say like, like done or something like that. When you're Pardon? When you're done uh, answering a question, just say like, don't give, give yourself a couple seconds and then say yeah. done. This is going to be an interesting one. <laughs> Discuss your Masonic journey. Gee, here I go with a great question. Of course, you probably won't hear the young man behind me that's asking these questions. He just asked me my Masonic journey when it began. Like I said a little while ago there that... Uh, it started back in 1952. Little did I know that uh, I would become master of this lodge in the year 2000. I've had a great time here. Uh, there's quite a few bodies that meet here. The LOS, 
Garfield Lodge, and Indiana Harbor Lodge. And I've been in line here, I bet, since 1988. Uh, I was installed as the chaplain. And uh, I would say that's actually where my journey began to the east. Uh, Worship Brother Charles Graves was a master that year. And uh, he asked me to be his chaplain. And I told him I would be happy to do that. Well, I went to the steward's chairs after that. And when I got to the junior deacon's chair, I stopped. I sat there for, actually I sat in that chair for three years. And then I just sat on the sideline for a while. And then all of a sudden I was elected junior warden. I don't know what they did about that now. Uh, it seems like uh, everything went great after that. Stop. <clears throat> I got to clear my throat. Trey, would you like something to drink? No, no. He said I get, uh, I take medication and my vocal cords start to squeak after a while. Yeah, yeah. And, or if you want to like, you know, pause and resume the yeah. same story, I can go right back to it. Okay. So do you want to tell more of that story? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, <clears throat> what has masonry done for you as a man, an employee, and as a philosopher? Well, it, that, most of all, it's taught me to do things uh, that I was, didn't think I was capable of doing. And I got a feeling that uh, a lot of people that come into Lodge and they see the little ciphering books and different things and they're told that there's a certain amount of stuff they need to commit to memory, uh, think, boy, I can never do this. Well, you can. You know, if I can do it, anybody can. The, uh, the things that we learn in here is what's keeping this Lodge afloat and I'm extremely proud of it. Stop. <coughs> Doing great, man. Thank you. What topics do you study in your free time? Well, I, I expand myself. Uh, I'm very much tied up with the Blue Lodge here, but I'm also tied up with the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. The York Rite I dearly love. Uh, it, it seems to tie us all together quite well. Uh, I couldn't say that uh, either the Blue Lodge is better or the York Rite is better. I do know this, that in order to become a Scottish Rite Mason or a York Rite Mason or a Shriner, you need to be a Master Mason in your Blue Lodge and be of good standing before you're capable of doing that, or able, I should say, to do that. Uh, stop. <coughs> oh. I like every now and then you go over to the camera. <laughs> I go Driving to, that point. <laughs> uh, Any more to say on that question? No. Is there any life experience wisdom you would like to impart to younger generations? Yes, there is. Uh, the question was asked about the putting something back into the younger generation that uh, were actually a good organization to join. When you join the Masonic Lodge, uh, of course you take your first three degrees in masonry to become a master mason and you have no idea where that's going to lead you. We have a young man here who happens to be the Grand Secretary for the Grand Lodge of the Free and Accepted Masons, and that's the most forceful brother, Richard J. Elman. I was here uh, every time that he got a degree, I was here. And believe me, this young man has carried masonry to places that's beyond uh, what I had comprehended at the time that he went in. So. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Uh, but I'm extremely proud of him. And I know that when we were on his committee for five years, uh, that's probably been one of the highlights of my uh, adventure into masonry was being on his committee. Uh, he gave us free range to, to do what we had to do to make the money in order for him to get through his year as Grand Master. I will never forget that. 
And uh, once you meet him, you'll know that he's a true brother. Stop. Good stuff. <clears throat> What do you think so far, Good. Another thing I might add to that is this, that this lodge was chartered on May the 28th, 1912. I believe that's recorded at Grand Lodge. I believe the charter in this lodge says May the 29th, 1912. There's a 24 hour period there that uh, we can't find. Uh, that doesn't make that much difference, but to me, uh, it does. You know, uh, I've even done some research at Grand Lodge on that, and uh, they're going to stick by their choice, and I'm going to stick by mine. So, at any rate, in 1912, up to current date here, this lodge is uh, probably 104 or 5 years old, and uh, one of the good things about it is We've never had a repeat in a, in a master. There's 13 lodges in Area 1, and uh, I've been to every one of them, and they've all had a repeat in a master. Now, why we've accomplished that uh, feat, I'll never know, with the exception that the incoming master has all of his dots on his eyes and all of his T's crossed. We do great ritual work here, and fortunately, one thing we must remember We've got some very nice young people coming into this lodge that's seeking greater light than what's on the outside right now. So. You can take out probably whatever yeah. you don't want in there, you know. Like I told you before, if there's certain things that we got to chop out, yeah. it might just have to be. Yeah. So I apologize. If no, no problem. You don't get offended. Can you describe the relationships and bonds with your old and younger brethren? I've been asked to uh, uh, explain my bond with the old and the young. First of all, I think to myself here that I've accomplished a couple of things in my life if I've not accomplished anything else. And I value it very much. And, the, and I was told by a, a past grandmaster and a grand secretary uh, most forceful brother Max Carpenter. He told me, Ben, he said, if you accomplish this, you'll make anything out of masonry that you really want, and that's peace and happiness. But first of all, you have to learn to communicate. So the first three things you need to learn is communications, communications, and communications. Brother, if you learn that, you've accomplished a lot. So thanks to most forceful brother uh, Max Carpenter, who has passed on, a dear friend of mine, uh, gave me that wisdom, and I've tried my best. As far as the youth goes, I think I've accomplished uh, communicating with the youth fairly well. It's pretty obvious. I've got a couple of young men here right now that's asking me a few questions, and I'm extremely proud of that. And, of course, with the past masters and the older fellows, I've seen them do their thing, and I'm very proud of them, too. If it wasn't for them, probably these young people wouldn't be here today. So my hat's off to them, and I do uh, appreciate all of them that is here in this lodge. <clears throat> if you need a drink, you want your, uh, your, your air, oxygen stuff, right? No, that's okay. I'm, I'm breathing pretty good. I take, uh, I take prednisone, a pretty heavy dose of it. And pretty soon it'll it'll start squeaking. I can't even sing anymore. No, I'm going to you ought to see. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, we had a minister in our church that uh, called me one night at midnight, and he said, "Hey, Benny," he said, "I got a great idea." I said, "Yeah," I said, "The idea is to let me get a little more sleep." And he said, no, he said, uh, I think if Elvis Presley would show up at church tomorrow, we could sell some tickets. I said, well, where are you going to find him? He said, I just did. I want you to be there in your Elvis costume, which I had done. So I went out and got an Elvis costume, 
and uh, I put it downstairs in the basement. <laughs> and when they were singing, I went down, I got dressed in it, and I came up the back stairs, and the choir was, the seats are all empty in the choir, and uh, they came down the sides, and they came up to sit in their seats up there, and this one lady, you know, she come up to sit down, she says, I, I was standing on the steps with my head down, and she said, well, I wonder who that is. And I said, well, there's Elvis Presley, Hannah. Who do you think it is? And she started to laugh. And I'm telling you, I just, I, I lost it there. I just went ahead and walked out. There was about 300 people in the church. And uh, we were having a spaghetti dinner for all these kids. But they weren't selling any tickets. So I, I promised the congregation, if they would buy some tickets and support this, that I would be there and perform for them which I don't know why I said that. But anyway, uh, in a half hour's time, I sold 90 tickets, so it worked. So uh, you can ask Charlie all about that. He's, Charlie's got the true story about it because I played four different characters that night. And uh, I'll tell you one thing Charlie called me. He told me I was the ugliest woman he ever seen in his life. <laughs> he, said, he said, he told that in here one night. He said, he was the ugliest woman I ever seen in my life. Ugly. And he went and hid behind Kay, Kay Trap. And Kay is about the size of that pole there. You know, <laughs> it was something else. So, but uh, I guess uh, you learn some of that from in here too. You know, I do not stress, do not get cold feet when it comes to doing stuff here. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, I don't do much of it anymore. Uh, it's it's the outside things that uh, we've got going on. I hope uh, with time uh, permitted, of course, uh, that you can support that. Uh, the corn roast is really good. It goes real well for the first couple of days. By the third day, you're getting tired. You get edgy. By the fourth day, everybody's like this. Start throwing corn cobs at people's heads. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, it's just... By the fifth day, you're ready to go home. I'm telling you. But the bottom line is, we make enough money to do some of the projects we're doing. It all goes back to the lodge. All of our time is donated time. And and most of us have a really good time. You know, so prepare yourself for it. It's over the 4th of July weekend. You'll have a good time. I'll ask you the question again. So, admission into masonry is achievable by any man, but it's exclusive. The structure of masonry can make a good man better. Will the quality of human life improve as the quality of Freemasons rises? Well, that's a yes. Now, I hope that you'll be able to put your question into what you asked me. Uh, Freemasonry will take you to places that uh, you never dreamed possible. Uh, once you're a Freemason, it, it is for life, regardless. Uh, that, that, that never goes away, regardless. Um, will the quality of your life improve? Yes, it probably will. If you abide by the obligations that you take here and uh, you're volunteering uh, your time here and the things that you do, you know, uh, it will uh, improve your quality of life. Uh, I would say that it'll probably make you think twice about doing some things that you're accustomed to doing because uh, you're giving your word that... Uh, not only to me, but uh, to the Supreme Being, that you're going to be a better man. Better man. Uh, so I think that uh, quality of life uh, is a definite yes. Let's stop for a second. Um, there's another part to that, right? Well, that was that one question. Um, that, then there's the next question after that, which was about like the public's opinion on Freemasonry. Uh, Do you have I, any, more, uh, any more to say on that? He, I can give you my opinion on that. 
Well, on the previous one or the next one? The next one. Now, you want to ask me ask me the question? Yeah. Let's make it try the video. What do you think the public's opinion on Freemasons is, and how would you like it to be perceived? Well, I've been asked about that many times about what the public thinks about uh, masonry. Number one, uh, we all have to realize that uh, bad news travels like wildfire. And folks out there that don't know anything about masonry, they have a habit of uh, believing everything they read in the paper or in books. Uh, I'm kind of a bookworm in a way. Uh, I know uh, I go to the half price bookstore to buy uh, my Masonic books and the first place you look is in the cult section. I don't know why it's there because we are not a cult. We're very well open here and if people would just understand that we're on the level and we're square with everybody and we're honest, uh, we don't cheat anybody, we don't steal from anybody, I believe that uh, Freemasonry will always have a place in this world. And yes, the, the quality and everything that goes with that is Freemasonry. I hope I've answered that uh, the right way. I think you did well. Now here's one of the weird worded ones. I changed this up a little bit because it was kind of odd, but it's still kind of weird. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm going to read the whole thing. Just let me know if, uh, if you can give an opinion on this. Is your voice going to be on there? Uh, I'm going to chop my voice out. So Freemasons, Freemasonry's, Freemasonry's history is preserved internally through our documentation and establish trust among our brethren. How can outsiders embrace and trust Masons while they're excluded from the fraternity? First of all, the lodge that we're in right now, currently, I am the tour guide here. If someone uh, has got negative remarks, uh, we could probably have a little chat with them and bring them in here and introduce them to the lodge. Because in reality, a lot of people that sort of uses the word uh, like bad mouth and masonry, they really don't know what they're talking about. So our job is to stand up for it and explain it to them the best we can that we are not somebody that's trying to preach something bad. This is a good, great organization. And I think if they're, the outside folks would take the time to learn about, a little bit more about it, they would be a little more hesitant to say something bad. Uh, I've experienced in the past where some folks have said bad things and they wound up petitioning the lodge and coming in and actually saying, well, I didn't know I was wrong. So those are the kind of little things that we as Masons need to look for. And we need to do this as much as we possibly can there again, that's where the youth is coming in, and we do have to pass this message along to them. Well said. We've got five more questions. Well, this is going to be a doozy. <clears throat> this is about the history of the lodge. <laughs> Worshipful, what is the history of Indiana Harbor Lodge 686? Well, I think I made, uh, far as the, well, I was asked by, about the history of this lodge, uh, I think I made a slight statement earlier on in this interview that uh, this lodge chartered in 1912 in the harbor section of East Chicago. Uh, Willard B. Van Horn was our first uh, worshipful master here. And he belonged to the East Chicago Lodge, and he was also the master there in 1910. Uh, so he was the one that really picked up 
picked up the ball and ran with it, and we've been running fine ever since. Uh, as far as the history and depth goes, we've met in the Whiting Lodge for about six years, or maybe a little longer, while this current lodge that we're in right now was built. It was built in 1973. Worshipful Brother Bruce Aldern was our first entered apprentice here. So our time goes back somewhat together since I went in back in the 70s also. So what we do is we try to talk to these young people, kind of get them involved, and then let them make decisions on their own and how they're going to go ahead and carry the history of this lodge on down the road. Uh, we also met in a place on, uh, I believe it was Guthrie Street uh, in Indiana Harbor. I can come back to this question later and give you more detail and uh, depth. We have a little history display out here that describes everything about this lodge and maybe we can touch on that. Any historical Masonic stories that you would like to share? Well, that's a good question, Masonic stories. If these walls could talk, I would be probably sitting here for hours on end about some of the things that uh, that's went on in this lodge. You know, it's. Uh, I was once told by a Grand Master that uh, there was a lot of serious things that go on in this lodge room, but don't take yourself too serious. That is really true. You know, we do have a good time here, and we try our best to keep it in order as much as we possibly can, and hopefully these young people will carry that tradition on down the line too. Okay. Anything else you want to share with that uh, question? Well... Any particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, random people from history that you want to talk about? Uh, if you want to think of one later, too, that's fine. Well, the only, uh, there's a couple of guys I could mention, you know, but uh, I think I'm going to pass on that one a little bit. Uh, I, I, there's uh, multiple stories I could tell you about. Uh, am I being recorded now? Yeah, they're still going. Um, I could tell you some really good stories, but uh, I don't think we want to put it on, the, you know. Uh, we did have a, a story. I could tell you one thing. Uh, it was during a degree back in, uh, in the 80s. I was a steward, a senior steward, and Rudy, Rudy and I will not use his last name, was the junior steward. And the worshipful master had directed us to go out and receive the candidate to bring him in. And uh, I looked over Rudy and all of a sudden he fell face first right out into the floor. And uh, everybody got shook up about it and even myself and the master went to the hospital with him. Well, little did we know that Rudy hadn't had anything to eat for five days. And uh, so once he got some food in him, he was okay. But he knew it was a degree night. And the Harbor Lodge has always been noted about having a real good meal on Thursday. So, uh, but it, back in those times, uh, we were eating after the degree, not before. So that was one of the kind of the unusual things that, that I've seen happen here. He didn't eat for five days? Uh, he, nope. He might skip a, a lunch, but no bet. <coughs> well, you have to know, Rudy. <coughs> so now we got three more questions. The, these two are uh, some, some weird ones. This is the, There's an honesty question and talking about the past and the future.
Can you detect honesty? Can you detect honesty or tell if someone's telling the truth? Uh, you know what, that's, that's really a great question. No, I cannot. But here's the thing. Uh, your approach to that person, your personal approach to that person could actually change his life. Because uh, if he sees something in you, like you see in him, and normally what happens is your first impression of someone is the right one. And what you try to do is uh, communicate to someone as honestly as you possibly can. And then you go by his reaction on how he responds to you. And But uh, who am I to judge someone? I don't do that. But uh, being honest nowadays is a real challenge, uh, as everyone knows. And uh, that's another good thing, too, because the promises that we make in here definitely changes you. And I think that uh, we sort of have to rely on some of that that will make those decisions for us. Good stuff. If you can comprehend the past, can you comprehend the future? In a way, yes. Uh, comprehending the past and the future in one sentence is pretty hard to do. The past, um, I can comprehend that pretty well because for the last 40 years or so, the future, uh, Currently, if uh, I'll just use the line in this lodge for an example, we have a, a great worshipful master here right now, Jerry Vanderlinde, and I trust this man with all my heart. And I, I do believe that with his guidance, that uh, we'll be good. We'll be in good shape here for the next, uh, at least the next seven years. And uh, this interview I'm doing, I'm, I'm almost sure that one day these young men will be in line in this lodge also, and they'll carry it further into the future. Uh, the, past, the masters that we've had before, uh, some of them have stuck around and helped these young people, and our future looks very bright. And that's it. Well, here's another. This is the final one. This is the doozy. I can't wait to hear what you got to say to this. What have you yet to learn? Everything. I was just asked a question here, what I was yet to learn. Every time I come in this building, I learn something. I'm in a different setting today than what I normally am. I'm with uh, two young men that uh, I barely know, but they are my brothers and I'm having a great time. You have to stop to think about this now. These young fellows that uh, are below 40 years old, and uh, I'm uh, currently 81, so I'm able to communicate with them quite well, I think, and uh, that's a good thing for me. All right, so that's all the questions. I think you did quite well. I appreciate you. Well, you this is a offering. To do you can thing. use that as a dry run, and yeah. we can do it again if you want. So we can always add more. Yeah, uh, there's things about activities. You know, what we do in our activities that we support the Schofield House. I think Jerry's gonna get in touch with the curator at Grand Lodge to do an internet apprentice degree there. Or the first section. Like but there's things that he has to do. Uh, first of all, we've got a charter up here on this wall, which we are not allowed to remove from this building without the permission from the Grand Master. So uh, he'll have to get that done. 
he'll have to get with the curator there, schedule the date, and then schedule the date with the lodge members and the officers. It all has to be coordinated quite well. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go down in, uh, I think it was 1992 or 93, we did an EA down there, and it's a beautiful place. And I would advise anyone, Mason or non-Mason, to go down and visit the Grand Lodge. That happens to be in uh, Madison, Indiana. They have a beautiful uh, historical district there too. So have you been there to no, Madison? And, and I want to talk to you about it, Ray. Well, it's, uh, they've, got, uh, uh, they've got a really beautiful bed and breakfast places there where you can stay. Uh, they mostly have like the Mennonite uh, ladies to take care of it. They serve you, they cook for you. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Uh, Clifty, Clifty Falls Park is there too also for camping. You've got a camper, right? Yes. And it would be a great place to camp. Uh, I believe they're probably already booked up for the year. I think they're always a year in advance on their booking there. But uh, if we would go, we'd probably stay at a bed and breakfast. Uh, a little bit on the high side, but well worth it. So... Uh, I, I don't know, it's, uh, like I say, I mentioned the corn roast, I mentioned the fish fry. These are all where, it's like the back door over here. I open that door up, set a table in front of that desk and a chair, and people come in to give their tickets over there. We've got another past master named Bob Evans, a real Bob Evans too, uh, that writes their names down and calls their name when the seats are available for them. Normally we have both sides of this lodge full with people waiting, plus the lodge room is, is full of people. So We go through a lot of fish. Uh, I think this will be our, I'm not mistaken, about our 38th year. Uh, and our corn roast is this year will be our 28th or 29th year. Well, it was in the, uh, yeah, I think it was 1988, so whatever that was, 28 years. A lot of fish. 30, 30, 38 years, yeah. So 38 years we've been doing the, the corn roast. That was during Charlie's term. That's one of the times when I opened up my mouth and addressed him uh, properly and uh, told him we, knew we we needed to try to sell some corn at the corn roast. He just wrapped his gavel and said, build me two cookers. So I did. Two hookers? Two cookers. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we've had a lot of fun there over the years. We've got uh, you, you another, the, is that recording now? Yeah, it's still going. Uh, another neat thing that I'd like to throw in there is we have a, a past master here by the name of Rip Johnson uh, and his two sons, two of his four sons, are members of this lodge. Uh, all three of them are past masters of this lodge and uh, Isaac and Rip were the ones that rebuilt all of this inside here. Uh, Rip's wife Bonnie was the one that uh, marbleized the columns and she painted these columns and she marbleized the one in the east and the one in the, the south. She's very talented. She also painted the heavens. So I, I think I'm very proud of those folks. Uh, they've done a lot for this lodge. Yeah, I think I'm gonna take a shot of. I can run around and get some of the paintings you know, up here. We can probably turn the light on up here so we can take a, a shot of that. <clears throat> then we can go out there. We can. Uh, Get a little clip of the past master photos and have you talk a little bit of the history of some of our stuff. I got the. Uh, did you want to take a picture of that? Yeah. I put the. Is that going to be? That's all the light I is got. Another light. This, this little rim of lights around. Is that good any brighter? Oh well, no. That's see. That's it. You might be able to point this at it. Yeah. Point the back light at it. 
show you more. Tell us a little bit about this, but well, there's not a lot I can tell about it, with the exception that uh, the wonderful lady Bonnie Johnson painted that. During the process of her painting, it, uh, I said, "Put the big dipper in there for me." And if you look closely up at the right, you can see the dipper there, and also the North Star is over here. And she put a small comet in there too. If you look right there, you can see it straight across the screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was all laying its own panels, and it's all laying on the floor, and it's put up in sections. So she is 